Snow White is a lady of many firsts. First Disney princess, first English heroine in an animated feature. Her voice was even on the first feature film soundtrack. Her dance-like, almost exaggerated movements helped build her character into an innocent child. Animators looked to models to help them get anatomy and expression just right. So, who did Snow White's animators look to? Let's find out. Marjorie Celeste Belcher was born on September 2, 1919, in Los Angeles, California. She began dancing as a child under the instruction of her father, Ernest Belcher, a noted Hollywood ballet coach who trained Shirley Temple, Sid Charisse, and Gwen Verdon. Marge was a ballet teacher at her father's studio by the time she was 12. In 1933, she was approached with an audition for a cartoon. They looked all over town for a girl of 13 or 14 who had had a lot of dance background but was not an actress per se because this was really more of a pantomiming job than mm -hmm. it was. And in those days there wasn't a lot of pantomime being done the way it is now. And they came to our school along with quite a few others and they picked three of us out of the class and I was the one who got the job. I think as much because I looked like their conception of Snow White as my qualifications. <laughs> In animation, the, uh, the animators usually take the movements and the dramatic uh, things right out of themselves. They have little mirrors next to them and they, and they look at themselves and they make terrible faces and do all of that. And that, the, like the, the animals or the dwarfs or any of those characters, they take from themselves. But a pretty young girl mm -hmm. is not, you know, I mean, what are they going to do? Look at this mirror and they're going to see those hairy faces there and it isn't really inspiring. So they um, would take 16 millimeter motion pictures of me going through the action as they saw. Marge performed dances, scenes, and special movements so the animators could caricature her actions and make their princess as human as possible. At one point, she even donned a trench coat and performed actions as two dwarves standing on each other's shoulders. She later modeled for the Blue Fairy in Pinocchio and Hyacinth Hippo in the Dance of the Hours segment of Fantasia, a ballet parody that she also helped choreograph. Marge was keeping busy. But her career did not pick up steam until she moved to New York in 1945. She became reacquainted with Gower Champion, with whom she had attended junior high school in Hollywood. The duo appeared in the 1945 show Dark of the Moon, and also worked up a nightclub act. In 1947, they married, and their Gower and Bell team became known as Marge and Gower Champion. Eventually, they returned to Hollywood, where they performed in several musicals at MGM, principally a lavish color remake of The Showboat in 1951. The Champions played leads in the agreeable Everything I Have Is Yours, 1952, and Give a Girl a Break, 1953, and supporting roles in films including Jupiter's Darling, 1955, but they were never top stars, and MGM eventually released them from their contract. After working a while in television, Marge and Gower divorced in 1973. Marge, however, went on to choreograph the feature film The Day of the Locusts, 1973, and won an Emmy for creating the dances for the celebrated TV movie Queen of the Stardust Ballroom, 1975. Marge continued to choreograph and consult on many TV projects. In 1978, she served as a dialogue and movement coach for the TV miniseries The Awakening Land. In 1982, she made a rare television acting appearance on the dramatic TV series Fame. Champion appeared in several stage musicals and plays on Broadway as a performer. Most recently, in 2001, she appeared as Emily Whitman in the Broadway stage revival of Follies. Marge Champion has had a full life of love, laughter, and dance. At the age of 100, as of the year 2020, she continues to laugh, love, and dance her way through life. You keep your passion alive as long as you can. Dancing is the hardest thing to do it with because the body gets older. But I learned that I could celebrate every decade for what it gave me. 
not for what it takes away. I can't do jumps, I can't do falls, I can't do a lot of the things that were very second nature to me, but I can move gracefully and tell a story through that. And I, I do believe that when one door closes, maybe it's an age door, a decade door, if you don't get upset about it, you'll find that a better one opens. Thank you for watching this episode of Dizographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it, and if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked in the description. We hope to see you in another Dizography.